I give greetings from my wife, Esty. Uh, we've been married 40 years this year. We have three children that are grown, two sons and a daughter. I'll tell you in a moment about them, Andrew, Luke, and Larissa. And we have eight grandchildren. So, yeah, God has been faithful these last 50 years that we've been singing in a group with Paul and other guys. And uh, all that time, we use music to bless people. And now our singing time is finished. And now I'm finishing by speaking, teaching. And I wrote a book, my first book. And hopefully, maybe tomorrow it'll be here. Uh, if not, then uh, Saturday and Sunday, we'll try to give it to you. Uh, it's a book about how to be a good father or growing up in a good father's house, how to bless your children. So many examples. We have it in English now, printed, electronic form also, and also on a, a flash key if you want to listen to it. So there's three ways you can get it. And it's being finished and published in Ukrainian and in Russian. Kniha vidi na ukrainskim jezike i na ruskom jezike. Takšo, it's just happening right now as we speak. But tonight I want to tell you something that we did as a family ever since my little children were born. My father was such a man of God. He was pastor of a local church in New Jersey. He was a he came to faith when he was 14 years old in a village in western Ukraine called Boratin by Lutsk. And he came home and he told his father that he went to a service, a missionary service. And he says, Dad, my sins are forgiven. And his father being orthodox, but they would only go to church on Easter and Christmas. Nominal Christians only, only in name. He said, son, you're not a sinner. Why would, you know, you don't need forgiveness of sin. No, dad, Jesus came into my heart. He forgave my sin. And so my grandfather who was friends with the Orthodox priest. And he was also mayor of the council of farmers in that little village. After one year, threw my father, Andrew, out of the house. And so my father went to live with Christians. And at 19, he began to preach and then he became a very well-known preacher. And later on, he led many people to Christ. And he came to America in 1950 through the war in Germany. And with my mother and my two older sisters, Rosita Popovich Davidyuk and Helen Lutzik Davidyuk. And so I was born in New Jersey in 1950. So I'm 67 years old and I'm feeling it. <laughs> I don't know if I look it, but I'm feeling it. As pastor said, we had some issues. I flew in at 3 o'clock in the morning this today. And so, yeah, so if I'm a little bit tired, you can understand why. But God is good, and he brought us here tonight to share something that we did as a family every day. I repeat. We did this, what I'm going to tell you, every day. Every day that my children were with us in our home. I did this because when I heard that my wife was going to have her, our first child, I was concerned. I had a little fear. It wasn't a big fear, but it was a fear that I could not be the great man of God. My father was. My father was such a man of prayer. My father was such a kind and loving person. Lord, how can I fill his shoes? How can I be the man of God he was? That was my concern. That was my, my worry, my fear. And so as we were expecting our first child, I got on my knees. I said, God, how can I be a man of God like my father? And God spoke to me. He said, you pray with your children, you pray for your children, and you pray with your children, and I will do the rest. Do you know we had two sons and a daughter, and as they grew, 
in New Jersey and then later on in Charlotte, North Carolina for the last 20 years. And we're in Missouri the last five. You know, they never went into the world. They became baptized in water uh, at age 14. They begged to be baptized. They wanted to go to heaven. Dad, we have to take water baptism. I never forced it on them. God baptized all of them with the Holy Spirit. and They spoke in tongues. They're good husbands and a wonderful wife. My daughter's a wife. They, they gave us eight grandchildren. But this is one of the secrets of our family. That my children never went into the world. They went to public school in New Jersey. New Jersey is not a, a Christian state. They went to public schools, elementary schools. But you know what? God gave such favor to our family. I was able to take my guitar. And we were singing choruses with the children and teaching the whole assembly. But that's another story. I don't have time to tell that story. But I believe that this is one of the secrets. Would you like to learn the secret tonight? If you're a young boy or a young lady, if you're a mother or if you're a father, look, you can take this message tonight how you want. But I'm telling you as God is my witness, we faithfully did this every day. <laughs> yes, every day. And I'll tell you how we did this. So this is called the armor of God. Do you know the armor of God is your best defense against the devil? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 12. And when we read this story, Paul is writing to the most mature church, to the church that John the Apostle later became the bishop of that church. Mary, the mother of Jesus who lived in John's house, she was a member of that church. That church had their first love, but they were deep in the Lord. So Paul was able to tell them things more mature, more deep. And Paul reveals a secret about the spirit world. Paul reveals a secret about the unseen spiritual war that's going on. Pastor Sergei mentioned opposition. He mentioned warfare. He didn't use the word. He used the word opposition. Do you know right now our nation of America is going through spiritual warfare. I believe there are evil spirits wanting to dominate the leadership of our government in the Capitol, in the Supreme Court, and in the presidency, and all the governors and mayors of the cities of our nation. And a war is being raged, not Democrat and Republican, not liberal conservative, not far left or far right, but a war is being waged over the spirit of our nation, over the founding principles of our nation, of the promise of the first pilgrims who came and begged God to bless them. And from their example came our Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the blessings of America. But now, let's talk about the family. Let's talk about your life, individually, personally. So Paul writes to this very mature church, chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren. It means this is the conclusion. <laughs> this is the most important part. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. You know, you need strength in a spiritual war. You need strength to withstand the attack of the enemy. And then Paul gives us practical verses how to be strong in the Lord. In verse 11, he says, put on the armor of God. What? What armor? Put on the armor of God. What armor? So you can be able to stand against. In this translation, it says the wilds. In another translation, it says 
attacks. In another translation, it says deception. Something that the enemy does against you. What is the armor of God? We read about it in chapter 6, but what's the purpose? What does it do? How do we put it on? Then, verse 12, he tells us something that we don't see. He tells us something that only God showed him when he went to heaven and gave revelation. Now, Paul doesn't give us much details. He only gives us titles. He only gives us the order of these forces, listen, against us. Verse 12, basically what he's saying, we don't wrestle against people. We wrestle against demonic spirits, fallen angels that have these categories. The categories are not important. I'm only going to speak about one category to give you an idea because it's very clear. But the categories are not important. What's important it is, is to prepare ourselves against demonic attack to be strong in the Lord, to push back the evil forces that want to attack a nation, a state, a church, a family, and your life. For we wrestle not against people, flesh and blood. Now notice, number one, principalities. I'll explain. Number two, against powers. Number three, against rulers of the darkness of this world. Number four, spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not important to know exactly what all four, and I'm not going to speak on them, except one word. Principality is the strongest of the four. What is a principality? It's broken into two words. Prince, we know what a prince is, yes? A prince is a ruler. A prince is a person who has power over a territory or a land. That's a prince, right? What is a palate? A palate is an old world, old word that means a village, a city, a group of people. That's why a town is called a municipality. That's where the town hall is. That's where you'll have to register your birth certificate, your, your marriage certificate. You go to the town hall of the municipality, which is the central governing place where the mayor and the city council get together. That's a municipality. But what is a principality? We don't have time, but if you read the book of Daniel, I'll tell you this quickly. And then we'll go into the armor of God, which is our lesson tonight. <clears throat> In the book of Daniel, he prays for the nation of Israel. Now remember, 70 years, God said, for this limited time, Israel will be punished, judged for their idolatry, that they prayed to many, many, many gods. He says, I will cure you. I will judge you. You will be 70 years as subjects to Nebuchadnezzar and the power of Babylon. After 70 years, I will bring you back to Israel. So as Daniel is praying and as Daniel is fasting, on the third week, the 21st day, an angel appears. Now, angels come from the presence of God. Angels have such power. We're talking all kinds of angels. Now, they can come looking like a normal man. That happened in the book of Genesis when some angels came to visit Abraham. They look like, but that's a disguise. In their normal state, angels have great glory from the presence of God. So much so that poor Daniel... He faints. He's like, ah. Oh. An angel lifts him up and strengthens him. And listen to 
what this angel says to Daniel. Oh, Daniel, you are greatly loved by God. From the first day that you prayed, your prayer has gone up to heaven and God has heard you. Wow. But Daniel was praying 21 days and no answer. How is it that God can hear a prayer and the answer doesn't come until three weeks later? And the angel explains why. He says, as I came from the throne of God, from the presence of God, to come down to the earth to give you this message in person, the prince over Persia, he opposed me. He withstood me. He warred against me and we fought. He prevented me. He stopped me. And we're Christians. We're scratching our head. Whoa, where is this prince of, who is this prince of Persia? It's not a human being. Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 6. We don't wrestle against people. Our warfare is against fallen angels, demons. And the greatest of them is a prince over a nation. This was the prince over Persia. Do you know what Persia is today? Iran and Iraq. Those are the two places where the religion of Babylon began. That was the place that Nimrod made a tower for astrology, the first organized religion against God. And in the book of, Re book of Revelation, it will be the last organized religion against God. What an interesting insight, but that's not our lesson. So then the angel tells Daniel, but Michael, the prince of Israel, he came. And he freed me from this warfare. And he now is battling the prince of Persia. And I am released to come to tell you this message. So think about this, dear Christian. Not everything happens by chance. And not everything is caused by the devil either. There's two extremes. One extreme says there is no devil. And the other extreme is the devil did everything. No, no, no. Sometimes you made a bad choice. I was foolish. And we pay the consequences for our bad choices. Yes? Okay. Don't say the devil made me do it. Because <laughs> the devil thought, man, I, I, I never thought of asking him to do that. <laughs> so he's happy that you did bad stuff. But it's not always his fault. Let's go to the next slide. So what does Paul say to do to battle, to fight against these principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places? What are we supposed to do? I don't believe it's a figure of speech. I don't believe it's like an example. I believe that this is something practical that we can do every day in our prayers I will explain so then he says stand firm then and he says take the helmet of salvation then take the breastplate the armor over this area of your body over the heart of righteousness then he says take the belt of truth. Keep on clicking as I'm talking. The belt of truth around your waist. And then have your feet put on the gospel of the sandals of peace. Yes? Next one. And turn to the next slide. And then it says, take up the shield of faith so you could extinguish you can defend against the flaming darts 
A dart is a small arrow. An arrow is a big arrow. But you know how they used to fight is that they would put oil, a rag on the point, put some olive oil, put fire, and then they would let the, the flaming arrow fly so they would stick into the wood and the olive oil would cause the wood to catch fire and they would burn down anything that's made of wood or made of trees or made of leaves or hay or, or stone. So fiery arrows burned everything down. It says, lift up the shield of faith to stop the arrows of fire from the evil one and take the sword of the spirit. Well, we've heard of that. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, right? It says, take the sword of the spirit, the word of, which is the word of God. And number seven, pray in the spirit all the time. On all occasions, with different kinds of prayers. There's prayers of asking, that's called petition. There's prayers of thanksgiving, yes, saying thank you for answers. We always beg, but we forget to say thank you. We always are desperate. Oh, heal, oh, save, oh, provide, oh, do this. And when God does, do we say thank you? Ten lepers were healed, only one came back. Wow. Ten percent of the people say thank you to God for answered prayer. Be in that ten percent. So here are the seven things of the armor of God. Go to the next slide. This is a picture of a Roman soldier. Our soldiers have modern equipment, but they have a Kevlar helmet. Secondly, they have a bulletproof vest. Thirdly, they have a, a utility belt. Fourthly, they have special boots that can run and are waterproof. And then... They don't have a shield, but they do have camouflage, and they do, st they do set up things that are against bullets. They don't have a sword. They have a, a, a side pistol, and they have machine guns and rifle, automatic rifles. And then they have machine guns. Then they have bazookas with grenades. And then they have mortars and artil artillery, and it goes on and on and on and on. And I'm sure that even the most atheist soldier, when he's ready to die, he says, oh, God, I don't want to die. There are no atheists in war. Would you agree with me? Everybody's scared to die. Now, take a look at these seven pieces of the armor of God. So now, practically speaking, okay? think about this. What are you supposed to do with this Roman soldier? What has what Paul wrote down have to do with our spiritual life? I'll explain to you. Go to the next slide. Each article of this armor of God speaks to something that we have to do in our spiritual life. So now let me give you the testimony. When my children learn to say dada, mama, and soon they started saying their first words, as soon as they could put few words together, we taught them to pray. If you're a parent, you know this. So then the first prayers, we make them repeat after us. Boise, Boise, God, dear God. Thank you for the day, for mommy and daddy. And they would repeat all those things. Do you know that, oh, they're too young to understand. Are you kidding me? Children know more about the spirit world than you know, than I know. Because they're sensitive to the spirit world. They'll see angels faster than you'll see angels. And they won't even tell you. They'll say, hmm, okay, bye. <laughs> Many, many stories where kids have spiritual experiences. They just don't know how to tell you. Because their hearts are pure and clean and, and their faith is childlike. 
That's another sermon. <laughs> so as I taught Andrew and then my son Luke and then Larissa, they grew up with prayer every day before bed. I remember I started to go to Ukraine because the Soviet Union fell. And then I resigned my pastorate, which I pastored for 10 years in New Jersey. And I went by faith. And my wife said, don't worry. I'll work in the hospital as a nurse. And we survived. God provided. And so I've been to the Soviet Union 117 times. 117 times. Because God put a love in my heart for Slavic people. God put a burden on my heart for Slavic people. But that's not what I want to say. So I have to explain to my, I think he was seven, six or seven, Andriko. That is going to go to Ukraine. And when I come back, I'll be with you. So he says, how many sleeps will you be gone? He doesn't count days. He knows how many sleeps. I said, give me your fingers. One, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four, and five. So when you finish counting your fingers, daddy will come back. Dad, that's too long. I said, son, daddy has to go tell people about Jesus. And when I come back, I'll buy you something. He didn't say anything. That night, this is a true story. He knelt by his bunk bed with Luke and him. And now he was at an age he could pray himself. Okay, Andrew, you pray first, then Luke. Jesus, he prays. I don't want my father to go to Ukraine. Honest. I'm waiting what comes next. But Jesus, I know he has to go and tell people about you. Bless him and bring him back home safe. Amen. I couldn't speak. Seven-year-old boy who loves his daddy, doesn't want him to go. He already understands that in our family, we put Jesus first. You put the Lord first. Why? Because at the beginning of every day or at the end when we went to sleep, we all prayed this prayer. Okay, now I put on my head the helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. I put on my heart the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness. I put on my waist the belt of truth. The belt. Put on my feet the sandals of peace. Sandals of peace. I lift up the shield of faith to quench, stop all the darts of fire from the enemy. I take in my hand the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And we pray at all times in the spirit. We prayed this through every day of elementary school in the mornings. We prayed this before I let him out of the car. In high school, they had their own car, my old Toyota Corolla. And they would wake up late. I would go downstairs. Dad, Dad, we're late. Put the armor on. Okay, put on the armor, the hand, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of rise, and belt of truth, sounds of peace. L lift up the shield of faith, quench the heart, doesn't look We hold our hands, sword of spirit, the word of God. Pray it all the time. Thanks, Dad. Bye. <laughs> Dad, we're going to be late. P put on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. Do you want your children not to go into the world? Put on the armor of God. What did Paul mean when he said, put on the armor of God? Oh, that's, that's a figure of speech. Okay, figure of speech. Nice. Just, oh, that's very nice. I believe those are defensive protection. So question, do you want protection for your kids or not? Yes, you do. I have eight grandchildren. And you know, when I'm with the grandchildren, I pray this prayer with them. And my kids smile, and they say, Dad, we do that same thing with our kids. 
Now let's go through the pieces of armor and that'll be the lesson for tonight. This is the ABCs of our faith. If we don't do the ABCs, the beginning, what kind of Christians are we? We have to know that just because we love God, it doesn't mean the enemy is not going to attack us. Hello? In fact, he doesn't attack people who are living in sin. He doesn't have to. Their sin will punish them. So the devil concentrates on who? The Christians. Because they're not serving his kingdom. Do you want to be safe? Or better word, more protected? Put on the armor. What kind of a soldier goes out to fight any war in any country without his helmet or his bulletproof vest or his weapon or his equipment that's what we're talking about now notice that the helmet covers the head the greatest battlefield that men will face in the christian faith is in the in the area of their thoughts the greatest battle young girls and young ladies and women will face is the thoughts I don't have to take an hour to tell you all the things that we need to protect against. But look at this. For men, it's thoughts of fantasy. It's thoughts of, oh, that young girl looks hot. Oh, I could do that. Or I could, oh. And you, and you know, once you think about it, then you start talking about it. Then you start desiring that. Then you're going to go out and do that. It begins in your mind. Proverbs says to the young man, of all the things that you guard, guard what? Your heart. But it's not the muscle inside your chest. Your heart is your thoughts, your decisions, your emotions. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The heart doesn't think, the mind thinks. So the helmet of salvation is a reminder Watch your thoughts. Is it wrong to have impure thought? No, it's not wrong. It's wrong to let it stay there. Billy Graham said this. I don't know if it's original with him or he heard someone else. He said, you can't stop a bird from landing on your head, but don't let the bird make a nest. Knock the bird away. Get away. That's what Abraham did when God told him to make a sacrifice darkness came why didn't God come in the daytime because God allows spiritual attacks why to make us strong hello to make us strong you're not going to be strong unless you learn to say no to sin no to temptation no to money no to the pleasure that is not from God then you become mighty in your spirit and you know, that's a battle. That's a battle. But you have to have the helmet of salvation. Next slide. No matter how good you try to be, no matter how you try not to uh, disobey the commands of the Lord, your righteousness is not enough. My righteousness is not enough. We need the righteousness of Christ. Amen? Amen. <laughs> where we confess our sin. And as a result, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin and he gives us his righteousness. Somebody say amen. amen. This is such a beautiful point. It means that we recognize we don't have the righteousness, but we ask for the righteousness and we put it on. It's a function. It's, it's say, every... It says, in the book of Revelation, it says... Blessed are they who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. So a robe is not a breastplate. A robe is a piece of material. But when you come to Christ, it gives you new clothes, like a beautiful white, white, sparkling white robe, garment. But when you walk in this world, 
A car will pass by and mud will splatter on you. You'll hear cursing. You'll see sin. People will do bad things. Temptations come. And that white robe could have spots on it. So what we do is we come to Christ. Lord, wash me. Forgive me for those thoughts. Forgive me for those words. Forgive me for those actions. Make me clean. David said, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. And that's God's righteousness. For our righteousness is as filthy rags. Then we come... I, in the scripture, it starts in a different order, but the order is not important. I just do it so I can remember it from top to bottom. <laughs> okay? That's, that's why I took it out of order. Because I don't think one is more important than the other. I think we have to learn how to remember it. So I said, head, chest, waist, feet, shield, sword, prayer. That's how we we'll remember. And by the way, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me when we come to the end of the lesson. Are you ready to pray that prayer with me tonight? Yeah. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> it says, and then take the belt of truth. Now, the belt of truth, do you know, if Christians lie, they lose their power. If Christians make believe, that's called hypocrisy. Do you know when we are really, truly loving God? When we truly want to have our, 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 our hearts clean and our thoughts pure, then we speak the truth. And you know what? Those are real Christians. There's power in truth. You know that people said about Jesus, he, does, he spoke with authority, not like other priests, not like the scribes, the lawyers of the law. Wait a minute. They knew the word of God, but they had no authority. Why did they not have authority? Well, Jesus said, they're a house without a foundation. Jesus says, they say, but they don't do. They tell other people how to live. They don't live that way. You have no power as a parent. You have no power as a preacher. You have no power as a Christian unless you do what the word of God says. And you're honest. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Own them. Confess them. Come to God. Become clean. Live what you say and say what you live. Amen? Amen. There's power in that. I think the number one reason why children of Christian parents go into the world is not just because of bad friends. It's not just because of university. It's because they didn't see the truth in their home. Phone rings, right? And the parent says, tell them I'm what? Not home. <laughs> right? What are you doing? You're telling your kids to lie. Tell them I'm not home. Now put on the belt of truth. Amen? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> and then on your feet, put on the sandals of peace. Let's talk about the Slavic world. In the Slavic world, in the Christian world, you will see people who are peacemakers and you will see people who are gossips, who slander and who divide churches. Yes or no? Ooh. Jesus said, blessed are the what? Peacemakers. Now the greatest peace is peace with God. Amen. And when we have peace with God, then we have to have peace with our wife and with our husband. And when we have peace with our wife and husband, we'll have peace with our children. Do you know, it goes to our authority. Authority is not saying, because I said so. That's not authority. That's bullying. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's bring it down to a human level. 
My mom didn't have time to explain, so she would say, because I said so. But my dad was smarter than that. Tato, why can't I do that? I'll tell you why, son. Sit down. And my dad, he would explain to me in such a way, I saw what he was talking about. I did this with my children. Whenever they did something against my wishes, they broke a commandment, they broke a painting. I wrote about this in the book. It's really funny. You know what I would do? I would put them in my place as a dad. And I would say, okay, sons, what am I supposed to do? What, is it? what would you do if you were me? Forgive us? <laughs> well, you'd do it again, wouldn't you? There's consequences. And I would co-opt them. I would convince them. I would explain to them the reasoning. And you know what? They got it. My sons now, oh, by the way, how did my kids turn out? Do you want to know how my kids turned out? My oldest son played professional baseball two years for the San Diego Padres. He was the player of the year in his university, batted 374 if you're a baseball fan. And then he said, Dad, I want to be a doctor. He went to medical school. Today he is a surgeon in Orlando, in the second biggest hospital in Orlando, Florida, healing people with a scalpel. He does cancer surgeries, right? He does robotic surgeries using robot arms to do microsurgery. He's one of eight doctors, and he does 12 to 15 operations every day. God has blessed my son. But he's not a minister. Oh, wait, wait, wait. He does cancer. He's a, he, he does cancer. And when people can't have an operation with cancer and medicine will not help them anymore, my son Andrew says, would you like to come in my office? He closes the door. He says, I cannot do surgery. It won't help. I cannot give you any chemo. It won't help. But if you want, I can pray with you. He said, Dad, nobody says no. Because as little children, they put on the armor of God. My second son, he has three master's degrees and one doctorate of psychology. Oh, psychology, that's, that's the worldly. Yeah, okay. Can a minister go and tell soldiers what to do? No, but a psychologist can. My son is a captain, and this month he will become major. So he's not second lieutenant, he's not first lieutenant, he's not captain anymore. He's in the top promotions, number 35 in the nation of medical. God has so blessed him as a psychologist to Air Force, Army, Marines, and Navy. Men and women who come from war and they're messed up. They saw death, they saw destruction, they saw their Friends blown up. Number one cause of suicide among military is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. He's in charge of suicide prevention, alcohol abuse, sexual abuse. And he listens to the worst stories you ever want to hear. My son, a Andrew, he can fix something by cutting and sewing. My son Luke has to listen to stories and speak to their hearts. You know, I've seen letters that they wrote to him, Dr. Luke, you saved my life. I was going to kill myself. Suicide prevention. I don't have time to tell you. You put on the armor of God. Larissa is a, a former teacher. She talk, took a C a class to A class in reading in one year. My wife is a nurse for all her life. I'm the only dummy in the family. <laughs> but I preach the gospel, and I read a lot, so I know what I'm talking about. And I'm preaching for 50 years. Holy Spirit is just all over me right now. He wants you to know that we are so casual about spiritual warfare. We're so oblivious. 
We don't see the spirit world. We can't. But there are people who want, to, there are demons who want to destroy your family. There are fallen angels who hate you. And any opportunity they get, they watch you to pull the rug out, to make you trip and fall. And so what protection do you have? You have it right here. Put on the armor of God. Put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of God's righteousness. Speak the truth. Live the truth. The belt of truth. And be a peacemaker. And we get to another. How many people get discouraged? You know why they get discouraged? Because their shield, they dropped it. If the bullets are flying, if the arrows of fire are in the air, are you going to go with your shield down or up? Think about it. Think about it. Whenever we allow the enemy to discourage us, the thing that Apostle Paul says, practical, 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 lift up, what? Shield of? So it will what? Quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. The number one thing today that is knocking so many young boys and girls of their Christianity is that they have, they have no concept of spiritual warfare. And so their shield is down and doubts. You know, that's the first thing that Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, said to Adam and Eve. What's the first thing did he say? Oh, did God say? Hmm, wait. Uh, yeah, I think so. Doubts. You're not going to die. You're going to be like God, knowing. God doesn't want you to know. You have to know evil as well as good. Do you know why God didn't want Adam and Eve to go to that one tree? Sometimes if you don't understand the scripture, oh, God is just being possessive. No, no. What kind of a tree was it? The knowledge of good, yes, and evil. You see, it's not that God didn't want Adam and Eve to know of the good. He didn't want them to know the evil. They were in a state of innocence. Well, let me put it to you this way. Do you want your five-year-old girl to know about rape? Do you want to explain to her the sexual perversions of our society? Is that an age where you're going to explain the evil? Not only explain, that's still later on possible, but personally experience. The Bible says that God says, I want you to be innocent about knowing evil. You don't have to take drugs to know what a drug addict goes through. You don't have to sleep with 10 women to know what sexual immorality is. You don't have to become an alcoholic to have a heart to raise to save alcoholics. You don't have to experience that evil. Is that a good thing, not to experience evil? Yes. So how would Adam and Eve learn about evil? Answer. They would go to God and say, God, what is evil? Ah, let me tell you. <laughs> and God would explain wisely. God would protect wisely. God would, as they matured, as they understood, God would use the right words. God would represent things from a God perspective. And they would have knowledge but they would be God-filtered knowledge. Somebody say amen. Do you want experiential knowledge or do you want God-filtered knowledge? See, when your child, as a small child, they know the difference between good and evil. I remember, and I never told anybody about this, 
But there was a man who approached me as a little boy, and he wanted to do a sexual act. And I said, no, my mom and dad wouldn't want me to do that. He ran away. Kids will approach your, your weirdos will approach your kids. We live in that kind of world. Hello? But the knowledge, God filtered. Are you, go away. My mom and my dad, you know, they, they wouldn't want that. I, that put the fear of God in him. He ran away. He was gone. Nobody was there to protect me. But you know what? God filtered knowledge protected me. Lift up the shield of faith. And then, how many of us, I don't say you, notice I said us, how many of us suffer temptation to do something wrong, to think something wrong, to say something wrong, to desire something wrong? How do we overcome that temptation? Well, Matthew 4 tells us. Do you know after 40 days, was Jesus hungry? After he fasted 40 days? Was he hungry? It's a simple question. <laughs> and then Satan uses his weakness of hunger. It's not a sinful weakness. It's just a human desire, right? To eat bread. Hey, 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 Jesus, don't those flat stones look like, like, like pita bread? Don't they look like... Uh, can you remember, you remember when your mom used to bake bread? Maybe even gave the smell of bread. And when you are fasting, you could smell food from here to the door. Yes? <laughs> what did Jesus do? He said, the word of God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He used the word of God, not to be. <laughs> right? Why do you have to go to the cross? Come to the top of the temple and you like float down. <sighs> Ascending from heaven. Whoa, this is the son of God. Don't put the Lord to a foolish test. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus, you don't have to die. I will give you what you're going to the cross to do to win the world. Back. I'll give it to you. One little detail. Just bow down, worship me. <laughs> Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him will you serve. Hallelujah. Do you know, I have memorized two verses of scripture that I use when I get tempted in my thoughts. I say, for the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down vain imaginations that exalt itself above the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And the thoughts go away. <laughs> you know, the thoughts don't go away. You say, mm -hmm, you know, that kind of be cool. Oh, yeah, that too. Mm -hmm. And if you stay, your thoughts will stay. And if you let them stay, they will build a stronghold in your mind. What is a stronghold? Back in the days, people would build castles and they would put a river around them so that only a door that they would open and close. And then that the walls were so high that people could throw rocks or boiling water down and people trying to put ladders to climb up those walls. Do you want a castle for the enemy in your mind? Cast them down. Cast down vain imaginations. And the last point, I don't have to tell Pentecostals, but unfortunately, not every child who, of a Pentecostal prays in tongues anymore. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of tongues is one of the most powerful weapons you could use and that will keep your Christian faith fervent and on fire. Now, I want to say the word, phrase, and you repeat it after me. I put on my head the helmet of salvation. I put on my heart the breastplate of righteousness. I put around my waist the belt of truth. 
put on my feet the sandals of peace. I lift up the shield of faith to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. I hold in my hand the sword of the Spirit. And I pray at all times. At all times. At all times. In the Spirit. I'm 67. My wife is 62. Every day when we pray, we finish our prayer. And my wife and I put on the armor of God. We're, huh? Yes. Every day that we, we remember. There's days, you know, that you forget. Every day. Pastor, every day. Every day. We're senior citizens. Come on. Like, the devil doesn't even care about us anymore. <laughs> He wants to get young kids. He knows he's not going to get this old guy. It's like, you know, who wants a suho fruit, you know? <laughs> who wants an old dried up guy? But we still do it. And that's what I want you to do tonight. So would you stand to your feet tonight? Do you have the helmet of salvation? Are your sins forgiven? Whose righteousness do you have? Yours or God's? You know, he will not give you your righteousness until you confess and repent of your sin and say, Lord, forgive me. I have made dirty what you have given me clean. You could do that tonight. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But where you're standing... If you need your sins forgiven, do you take care of that tonight. Agreed? Agreed? Have you been arguing with someone lately? Have you been fighting with your parents? Do you hate your brother or sister? Somebody hurt you and you're so mad at them? The Bible says forgive them. But they were wrong. Yes, they were wrong. But forgive them. I don't want to forgive them. I know. We don't, we really don't want, I don't want to forgive people. But Jesus forgave and he says, if you want me to forgive your sins, you've got to forgive others too. Forgive them. Some of you need to do that tonight. Say, Father, forgive them, they hurt me. Say, Father, I forgive them. Have you been discouraged? Have you ever thought about quitting tonight? Let somebody else do it. I'm tired. How come I always have to do it? You know what happened? The enemy shot some arrows of discouragement because your shield was down. Lift up the shield of faith. Jesus, I believe your word. Amen? Jesus, I belong to you. Jesus, your word says that use the sword of the Spirit Pray in the Spirit. I don't know what I'm saying. I know. But pray in the Spirit, said Paul. And then pray in the language you know. Let's take this time to pray. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, forgive us. Because we're so relaxed. We're too relaxed in our spiritual lives. Give us, Father. Give us, Father, strength, Lord. Call out to God. Call out to God. Call his name. Call upon his name tonight. Put on the head of helmet of salvation tonight. Ask forgiveness for your sins. Put on his righteousness, not yours, not mine. His righteousness. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Come, 
Let us reason together, says God to the prophet. Put on the belt of truth. Talk truth. Confess your sin to God. Be honest with yourself and with God that I've been, I've been foolish. I've been argumentative. I've been hateful. I've been bitter. I've been fighting with my dad or mom or my sister or my brother or my best friend or someone in the church. They hurt me. Forgive tonight. I forgive in Jesus' name. Father, forgive them. Pray it. Pray it. Release them from sin. Release them tonight in Jesus' name. Release them in Jesus' name. Oh, we release the power of God to forgive, the blood of Jesus to wash and cleanse. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Lift up the shield of faith. I believe, Lord. Forgive my doubts. Forgive my complaining. Forgive my discouragement. Forgive. Forgive my depression. Lord, I believe your word is true. Lift up the shield of faith. Lift up the shield of faith. Use the word of God. Learn some verses. Learn them. Learn them. The word of God says. And pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit and trust the Lord. Oh, Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Just close your eyes. What do you want to say to Jesus? If he was here, what would you say to him? Talk to him. Say, Jesus, I want to serve you. I want to love you. I want to walk with you. Moms and dads, pray for your kids by name. Pray for them by name right now. And you pray for your dad. Pray for your mom. Pray for your brother. Pray for your sister right now. Be a peacemaker. Bring peace. Bring peace to your family. 
bring peace to your church. If you need to repent because you didn't bring peace, repent. But be a peacemaker. Put on the sandals of peace. Speak the words that bring peace. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, tonight, in Jesus' name, we pray, Father, for these people in the audience. We pray for every pastor. We pray for every spiritual leader. We pray for every dad, every mom, grandpa, grandma. We pray for every son and for every daughter. We pray for every child. We pray that the protection of the Holy Spirit would be upon us with the armor of God every day, every day, every day, every day. That we would stop dying, stop falling down, stop letting the enemy push us around, but that we'd be mighty in spirit, that we would be protected, and that we would put on the armor of God, that we would be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, that our inner man would be strengthened, Lord, that the eyes of our faith would be enlightened, Lord, that the pressure from the outside would be equaled by the pressure on the inside by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Father, we live in a wicked, evil time like Sodom and Gomorrah. But Jesus, you have called your church to be the light of the world. You have called your church to be the salt of the earth. You've called your church to stand against the opposition of the devil. And if necessary, to die for the word of God, for the gospel. To suffer and not fail in our faith. Those that are failing in their faith, let them re-examine if they are in the faith. And give a stronger faith to defeat all the wicked thoughts of the enemy. And all God's people said, and all God's people said, Amen. third time, and all God's people said, Amen.